For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed, and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked his name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were, uh, they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tartar. Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up. Living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Saul, the new convert, evangelizing in Damascus, and subsequently being lowered through a wall to safety because he upsets the Jews of the synagogue. Today's scripture involves a grown man in a basket, <laughs> with a few new friends holding the rope on the other side of the wall. So what if we had to sit down with Saul, also known as Paul? to discuss the beginnings of his successful missional career. Well, first we would ask, how do we pronounce your name? Saul? Paul? Saul would answer, now that I'm further into my missional work with the Gentiles, I go by Paul. But either would really work. Thanks for the clarification, Saul Paul. <coughs> Since your name is Saul in scripture today, we're just going to go with that, as long as you don't mind. So, how was your first week on the job, Saul? Saul would most definitely answer, I was let down, through the wall, in the basket, and ran away. <laughs> if anything, he would boldly tell us of the help he received during his first days in ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, blessed be he forever, knows that I do not lie. In Damascus, the governor under King Naredus guarded the, the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Saul, therefore, embraces the position of vulnerability he was put in by the, by the Lord in the hands of the disciples that lowered him down through the wall in a basket. And this all sounds pretty ridiculous, and this all looks pretty ridiculous. And until we get a healthy dose of context to better understand Saul's shameless escape from Damascus, we're not really going to get it. So we'll start by putting Saul's preaching in context and go from there. Saul's shamelessness begins in his ability to do this preaching in the synagogue only a few days after his conversion to the way. The with a capital T and way with a capital W. Those who followed the way believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They were following the way of Jesus, and we would nowadays call this Christianity. Here's the thing. Up until a few days prior to today's scripture, we know that Saul, a Pharisee, imprisoned Christians and testified that they should die. Saul was on his way to Damascus to imprison more Christians, and that's when his life turned on its head. Correction, that's when Jesus turned Saul's life on its head. And when Jesus approaches Saul, Saul loses his sight and must hold the hands of his companions as they continue on their way to Damascus. 
as commanded by Jesus. Saul finds his disciple in Damascus, Ananias, and Ananias restores Paul's sight. Remember, Ananias, as a disciple of the way, as a Christian, would have only days before been another life to take on Saul's list of things to do. Despite this reality, Ananias still lays his hands on Saul's eyes to restore his vision and welcome him into Christian community. This will be thematic of all the disciples that Saul encounters in Scripture today. So here's Saul, a new convert with a restored vision, who wants to go tell it on the mountain. But Saul doesn't understand the urgency of his commission until Ananias shares Jesus' specific assignment for Saul. And now why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. It is here where we begin to understand Saul's shamelessness. He was told that his sins are washed away, and he needs to move forward. Saul isn't to forget about the past. He's not to forget about his sins. He has to remember what he did as a Pharisee to know where he is going as a Christian missionary. He has to remember his life as a persecutor to truly <coughs> understand his life as persecuted. Saul has to remember what he did to truly understand what the disciples welcoming him into Christian community means. The disciples hold nothing against Saul. They know that God has plans for Saul, and they know that Saul is meant to better connect to Christian community. Saul, a former bigot and individual, has to move forward and quickly into Christian community. He boldly enters the Christian faith as a missionary, with a heart for everyone so that they might experience the love of Jesus Christ. Now we understand the depths of Saul's shamelessness when he calls on Jesus' name in the Jewish synagogue in Damascus. This is the context we can hold tightly to when we see Saul being completely and totally vulnerable in a basket, being lowered by those he once persecuted. Imagine the help you would accept if you knew that Jesus commissioned you to shamelessly live in Christian community with urgency. And now why do you delay? Get up. Be baptized and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. When we consider that Saul most likely repeated this commission to himself through both successes and failures, probably especially failures, we all need a good reminder, the image of him preaching Christianity in a synagogue becomes less ludicrous, and the image of a grown man in a basket makes complete sense. And now we'll do today's scripture. The help that Saul's fellow disciples offer him in today's scripture shows that real Christian community always offers a place of belonging. We show belonging in the form of service, and service manifests as hospitality. And in the wider culture, hospitality is basically taking care of what you're putting in charge of. You open the door and let someone in, you show them a seat, you give them a glass of water, or tea, or coffee. You don't just open the door and then walk into your room and sit on your bed while they hang out in your living room. But in the church, hospitality with theological foundations is stewardship. And we as the church are called to be stewards of our relationships. And while it's more obvious and acceptable to serve others, I think we need to start serving others in the radical reception of receiving. And radical receiving looks like Saul continually responding to Jesus' invitation throughout today's scripture. And now why do we delay? Get up, be baptized, and have our sins washed away, calling on his name. In order to receive from others, we must first respond to Jesus, and this is precisely what Saul does. Saul dives into his calling and lives it out. Saul shows up in the synagogue. Saul shows up in a basket. And Saul even shows up when he jumps out of the basket and goes straight for Jerusalem to continue his mission. He has just escaped an assassination attempt, only to be happy to risk his life once again for the gospel. Saul's encounters with the disciples in Damascus, with Barnabas in Jerusalem, and with the believers in Jerusalem are all involved Saul's shameless and radical vulnerability to the Lord's call. Saul radically received what his Lord Jesus had to offer, and from there, the acceptance of others' help was easy. Cake. That is what's so crazy about this passage. Saul's radical and powerful reception of help. Saul's radical and powerful reception of community. 
And it's not hard for us to understand that giving is good. As we've been taught throughout our lifetimes, living in community requires giving yourself to that community. You have to give and give and give. As Christians, the idea of giving to be a part of a community is very obvious. It's been drilled into our minds over and over again. We are to give our advice to our neighbor. We are to give our efforts to the greater cause. We are to give our energy to the church's spring cleaning. We are to give our money to the church's work. And we have to give our prayers on behalf of others to Jesus. I mean, even in today's wider culture, we're told that we should give not to receive, but for the warm, fuzzy feeling giving leaves in our hearts. We give because giving is what is good and wonderful and right. Giving without anticipating praise or reciprocation is what is courageous and bold and fearless. Again, the idea of giving is something we readily understand. The idea of Saul radically receiving is also something we can get with context, with a lot of explanation. So what I'm saying is this, we're happy for those who receive help. Good for you, you reached out, you're so brave, because those things are all true. But for some absurd reason, we are not happy to receive help ourselves from others. We were not taught to ask for help growing up. And the simple analogy is this, to ask or receive is an indicator of weakness, and to give is an indicator of courage. Done. Simple as that. The problem here is that we continue, if we continue living into this foolish independence, we are missing the point of the gospel. Through the gospel, we are given permission to fully rely on Jesus, and that is the good news. This is how Saul lives. He fully relies on Jesus. The illusion of independence in Christian community makes it so we reject the gift that Jesus offers us. The gift that Jesus offered Saul. And now why do you delay? Get up. Be baptized. I have washed away your sins. Call on my name. Jesus offered us grace and we as Christians accepted it. Now we have to live out our baptism every day by radically receiving Jesus' grace through the help of others. When you receive from others, you are not only receiving from other members of Christ's body, you are also getting something from the Lord, and that is exactly what sets Saul's example apart, so very apart from how we typically and incorrectly view our roles in Christian community. Saul lives boldly for the gospel, and living boldly for the gospel means radically receiving from your Christian community. This boldness has little to do with us. This boldness is the daily, the daily manifestation of the assignment Jesus of Nazareth once gave a man named Saul. And now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. Like Saul, we are not to delay. This is urgent. Like Saul, we are to earnestly tend to our relationships in Christian community by accepting help from others because we first accepted help from Jesus. And like the disciples, we are to excitedly receive all people into Christian community because Jesus Christ first received us. We have to be just as quick to advocate for a friend as we are to receive support from a friend. We have to be just as quick to jump in the escape basket as we are to offer an escape basket. I'll say that again. We have to be just as quick to jump in the escape basket like Saul did as we are to offer an escape basket like the disciples did. It's urgent. And conveniently enough, we're in the middle of a stewardship campaign. So why not actively work to be stewards of your relationships today? Like Saul, we are to take a risk in vulnerability, a risk in trust, and a risk in investing in others. At Kingston, these risks can be practiced in the form of small groups, or seeking church fellowship beyond this hour of worship, and meeting to run, or woodwork, or pray, or talk about the Bible, talk about pop culture, and I know we already have an awesome 
oh, huh. I did improv and then I tried to repeat what I wrote. <laughs> Christian community. 